music. Welcome back to another Everyman Movie Critic, where we bring the love of movies back to you. And as always, it's me, Johnny B. And I'm Scott. So this week we're going to talk about what happened to Canon Films. Now if you're a child of the 80s, you know all about Canon Films, and you probably always wondered what happened if you're like me. There are a couple documentaries out there. There's the Go-Go Boys that goes more into the nicer side of what happened. And then there is Electric Boogaloo, the untold story, which is more of like the bad aspects of what happened to it and all the people who did not like working for them. And I definitely recommend both documentaries if you want to get more detailed information about what happened to the Canon Pictures. Ken films. So initially, actually, um, Yoram Gol Globus and Menachem Golem were two, well, they were one uncle and nephew in Israel, and they were pretty big over there. And they won a lot of awards for their movies. And they wanted to make their transition to the United States. Now, they, there was a film company called Canon Films. So it was basically started by these two guys in 1969 or 1967, excuse me, the Canon films. And they had some moderate successes. Their biggest movie was called Joe, featuring Peter Boyle. All of you guys should know him from Frank, as a uh, young Frankenstein, he played Frankenstein. Or if you're more of a TV buff like Scott, he came from Everybody Loves Raymond. He was their father. Now, fast forward to 1979, when Mahakam Golan and Yoram Globus moved to the United States, they actually bought Canon Films for $500,000 in 1979. And that's when they started booming their movie production. And they actually had a very interesting style of how they produce movies. What they would do is they'd go to film festivals, and they became famous for this. You go to Cannes Film Festivals every year, and instead of actually selling a movie that was already finished, they would sell a movie that was just the idea of it by having a one shot or one you know one page with an actor's name and the idea of the movie and they'd sell it to all these producers all over the world and that's how they got a lot of their movies made just an idea of a movie and that's very unheard of back then in Hollywood it was very unique to them and it actually worked so they started making things early on in their first bigger movies were anything basically with Chuck Norris or Charles Bronson and they actually had two piles of scripts both of which were called just the Chucks and one for Chuck Norris one for Charles Bronson and during this time in the early 80s they also started like movies like their ninja movies if you know anything about those there was Enter the Ninja Revenge of the Ninja and then Ninja 3 The Domination now throughout their history they had some hits some misses Mostly misses, mostly just they called it schlock, as a term that was thrown out often. I'm sure you remember the ninja movies. Yeah, I saw them. Which one was your favorite out of the three? The, the Shokasugi ones. They all kind of rolled into one to me, so that wasn't really. Yeah, they pretty much favorite. Did. Yeah. Now it was interesting because the third one, Ninja Three: The Domination, they actually turned it into like a exorcist movie too at the same time and they took Lucinda Dickey who was actually in one of their biggest hits Breakin and Breakin 2 Electric Boogaloo now there's actually an interesting story behind that too back in the 80s when they were trying to get one of those movies out there was another film company coming gonna release a breakdancing movie called Beach Street and Menachem Golan wanted to get his out first so he actually took only a few weeks to film Breakin and that's actually one of the best soundtracks from the 80s, too. If you go back and listen to the movie, you'll see that there's quite a bit of hits back then that were from that movie. But anyway, so back, fast forward back to Ninja 3, Lucinda Dickey, who didn't know much about breakdancing, and she also didn't know much about being a ninja either. They just liked to use her. They were kind of, she was like a little bit of their it girl. Now, these movies weren't exactly big commercial successes, but they were, they were very cult successes. And that's basically what a lot of the canon films were. 
I mean, they did have a couple movies that won awards. There was uh, Joe, which was not the the uncle and wasn't Golden and Globus that owned them back then, but they had Runaway Train, which was a movie with Eric Roberts, and I think that was up for like Best Picture back when that came out. So they had a bunch of like they did a lot of like. At first, they did a bunch of horror movies like Schizoid, and that was their that was their initial like go to. Then they started doing like all those sex films, like Lady Chatterley and that. And then they went into exploitation action films, like the Ninja films. Um, pretty much anything with Chuck Norris in it. It's kind of a not exploitation, but like over the top action, like Delta Force. I'm sure you remember Delta Force yeah. and Invasion USA and even his Missing in Action movies. Those were really good. And then Charles Bronson started his career with them by doing Death Wish 2, which is a follow-up to his huge hit, Death Wish. And that was actually a very controversial movie back then, Death Wish 2, because it was like involved rape and some other very controversial topics, even for back in the early 80s. Do you remember any of those Death Wish movies? Barely. Um, I don't even know if I watched them. I know I saw them on TV a lot uh, when I was a kid. But um, like the Chuck Norris movies are always on there. But they were when I was younger. They were always later movies that you're I wasn't supposed to be up for. <laughs> um, like all of us. Yeah. Thank God for Cinemax in the eighties. After ten o'clock. So what canon movies really stick out in your mind when you were growing up? And come on, don't you remember that canon intro? Doom, doom, doom. Mm -hmm. And it had that big, whoosh, you could feel that thing coming at you, and you knew you were in for a good movie. Especially Chuck Norris. I mean, mm -hmm. anything, he, every time you saw that, doom, 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 you know. Yeah. If I can get that Canon logo on the video and put it on here, I'm definitely going to show that because you can feel that. And it was like it came right at your face, and it had like that boom to it, and you know, oh, great, a Canon movie. I remember Firewalker, especially. That was a Chuck Norris one with Louis Gossett Jr wasn't as big, but it was back when the Indiana Jones movies were huge, and they had like their Alan Quartermain movies with uh, with Canon. They had King Solomon's Mines, and then in the Lost City of Gold, which were just cashing in on a lot of those movies were just cash-ins, yeah. obviously for other movies, but they were pretty big. And Firewalker stands out to me because I just remember as a kid seeing that vroom coming right at you. But anyway, tell me about more of the movies you remember as a kid from canon. Um, I'm going by the list that you have here. Um, I saw, I'm pretty sure I saw Cobra. Um, I didn't see Breakin', but I, I think I saw Breakin' 2, Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo? Yeah. That was the one that, that they took a huge step back from what they did in the first one. Over the Top with um, Sylvester Stallone? Yep. That one definitely was... Now, the interesting story about that, prior to this movie, to Over the Top, they would never pay money, big money, for an actor to be in their movies. They would just settle for people who were just willing to make a lot of movies. And so they actually got, like, I think it was around $12 million, somewhere around there. And they hired Sylvester Stallone to be in that movie, and Menachem Golem actually directed it himself. He was cashing in on the whole Rocky vibe. Mm -hmm. Where he just wanted another underdog story where the guy was fighting to get his kid back. Had a lot of great elements and it actually made shine a big spotlight back on uh, arm wrestling back then. It was like oh, a huge God. thing. I remember in our school, mm -hmm. we were arm wrestling every freaking day because of that oh, yeah. movie. And try the over the top. Over on the there, top. My it? son does that to me now, to this day. <laughs> and it's a classic. I remember seeing that in the theater. So yeah, you're right. But before then, that was their very first, and that's like that was kind of like the beginning of the end for them, right mm -hmm. around over the top, when they finally had to pay a lot of money. So what they would do, their financial structure was they would borrow money from the banks or whoever, and then they would use that money toward another movie and hope that the returns of that would cover the next movie and so on. So it was kind of like a snowball effect, and eventually just caught up to them. But we'll get into that more a little bit at the end of this video about what was their ultimate demise. I definitely did enjoy Over the Top, though. Um, you remember Life Force? Cashing in on the alien vibe? It was that... If you ever seen the new movie Species, or not new movie, but yeah. Natasha Hendricks, it's like that, It's but they're more like alien vampires or something. You probably would actually like it. 
I might have seen it. I just a lot of TNA too. That was a big thing for Canon films. Anything that had an R rating, you knew you were going to see some TNA. It was just a staple. If I knew an actual list of the Canon movies, I'd probably watch more obscure ones. Um, like, um, remember the Apple, or even the Hercules movie with uh, Lou Ferrigno. Mm-hmm. That was right around the time when he was trying to cash in from Conan. Yeah. They were trying to cash in on that. And instead they couldn't get Schwarzenegger. Because he was yeah. too... He no, would, they would never be able to afford him. I had stuff on Hercules for the... Um, the um, one of the TV to movie, movie to TV things. Speaking for that. Um, but... Do you remember Cyborg? I mean, there's another interesting story. That's how Van Damme got his start. He was actually a Mono uh, Menachem Golem actually did not want to hire him at first. He was working at a restaurant, and they were there, and they were talking about. And he did a kick over his head. Van Dam actually talks about this in Gogo -Go Boys documentary, and it's actually a pretty cool story. And he didn't like him at first. He didn't think he was going to be anybody. But then they were like, he kept plugging away and trying to get into his movies there. And then Menachem Golem was like, all right, give him Bloodsport. And the rest mm -hmm. is history. Then he did Bloodsport, Kickboxer. Those are two big hits for them yep. on video. They're really not so big in the theaters, but they were big on video. I remember watching Bloodsport as a kid on VHS, and then I was hearing, oh my god, Kickboxer. And then Cyborg was actually one of their last movies. And Cyborg is actually an amalgamation of two different movies that they never got to make back then. And that was near the end of their career. It was like they wanted to make a He-Man sequel, Mm -hmm. And they were trying to make Spider-Man, and neither one of them came to fruition because they just couldn't get it off the ground. And so they took the sets from mostly from He-Man Two, and used those to make Cyborg. A lot of the costumes and everything else they just used it on Cyborg, and that actually ended up making a profit for them, much needed profit back then. A little too little too late, mm -hmm. but well, the um, like when you. Uh, over the top there, I keep going back to that. Um, Master of the like Universe. The Master of the Universe I saw. I like that. But um, the, I, I know we touched on this, or I touched on it before with you, um, about my liking of um, like a tournament type of um, yeah. movies. Yeah, so that's kicked so off it's like, yeah. plus four. Yeah, those I liked. Uh, the Quest I liked from um, Van Damme. Van Damme. But um, Over the Top. Not a canon film, but still yeah. a great action movie. The um like if it's a movie that has actual um like a tournament where they go through that I enjoyed that yeah those are um, always fun I always like those too yeah but the ones that it's just um them going through and saving something um or doing something I'm not as big of a fan of uh, that's mostly what the Chuck Norris movies were was him uh, just blowing stuff up yeah and I'm um, getting Invasion USA was like huge for that. Yeah, and I mean, he he was he had a purpose. He was going to save somebody, or he was going to do something. But that's um, pretty much yeah, that was his career. Yeah. And um, I mean, Charles Bronson was kind of a similar. Well, he did revenge, style. more yeah. revenge flicks with the, especially with the uh, Death Wish movies. Those were all revenge flicks. Yeah. He wanted to kill somebody because somebody killed somebody in his family, or they raped his yeah. daughter in part two, and then they went after. He went after everybody. I did see the Bruce Willis remake. It was pretty good. The Death Wish. Mm. Not as good as the originals because you can't touch the originals, but it did beat for beat is pretty much the same movie. Now I do remember like there was like the penitentiary. They did like a series a bunch of series movies, like American Ninja. Now initially with American Ninja, they wanted Chuck Norris to be in that, but since he didn't want to cover his face, he refused to do it. So they hired Michael Dudikoff and he ended up taking two of them in a row. Then they recast, they put somebody else in the third one, and then the fourth one, the three, the two of them worked together. Then there was like the penitentiary films. Those are those box in, you know, those boxing movies inside the prison. Um, Barfly was an actually a Mickey Rourke movie with Faye Dunaway. That was another Academy Award bait movie, along with Runaway Train, which we mentioned earlier with John Voight and um, Eric Roberts. Um, then you have uh, movies like. Kathy Ireland, we were mentioning her in our sports one, and she actually won a movie with when she won the uh, Sports Illustrated cover. She made Alien from L.A., and that was from Canon Films. I remember I like that, that movie. I saw that. The only thing I didn't like about that movie was there was two lead guys in the same movie. She fell in love with one guy in the beginning, and then she ended up falling in love with the, that second guy who only came in for like the last 20 minutes of the movie. 
It was like the weirdest like casting. I've never. I was like, what the heck is that? Her voice was very unique. I think. Yes, she had that high pitched, squeaky voice. Yeah. And then the one movie that I actually had to cover for, in one of our videos, that four pack, the Treasures of the Treasure of the Four Crowns. Um, that was in one of their 3D movies that they had back then. Go check that one out. It's actually a pretty good watch. It's another one of those cash into like Indiana Jones where these these guys wanted to raid this tomb and be, get the power from the thing and get money and whatever. But that was like their basically their whole career. Um, and then they near the end, like we were just talking about, the beginning of the end was Masters of the Universe mm -hmm. and Cyborg. So when Ma Masters of the Universe that movie actually ran out of money. So if you remember that last fight with Skeletor and He-Man, where it's all dark, that's because they had to shut down production. And they had enough film left to film that scene. So they filmed it with no lights. They just had whatever lights they could find in the background. And they and everybody thought that was just a cool, like, thematic choice to make to film that. But it was actually because they ran out of money. And they that movie did not make any money. And then they bought the rights to like Spider-Man and some other and Superman. They actually tried to make Spider-Man, and it was said that Golan and Globus did not have any idea of what Spider-Man was. They thought it would be more like a werewolf or a teenager turned into a giant eight-legged tarantula, and nobody wanted that. Thank God they never made that movie because he didn't. They didn't understand what that was. Yeah. And then they bought the Superman rights from the Salkinds after Superman three was such a. Mm, so so movie it was more of a I know I said this before but it was more of a uh, Richard Pryor vehicle than anything and Superman was kind of in the background yeah. kind of how like all the Batman movies were back in the 80s with Tim Burton all Super Batman was always in the background to the villains but uh yeah so they did Superman 4 huge disappointment in the box office did not make any Christopher Reeves actually took a lot of convincing to even do that movie he didn't understand how th he was worried about that from day one that they were not going to have enough money to make that movie. They did not... You could tell the budget was horrible. I mean, they thought they made up powers for him in part two, you know, like where he took the thing off his chest and threw it at them, and it covered the one guy, and he did the multiplication Superman, which is not one of his powers. I mean, you should know that from mm -hmm. comic book lover that you are. But Superman 4 was even worse. He goes off and rebuilds the Great Wall of China just by using his eyes. <laughs> I was like, What? They were taking the whole Rewind Earth thing that they yeah. used in 1 and 2. Well, actually in 2, that was initially what they were going to do at the end. He was supposed to do it again, and they scrapped that. The new director, Richard Lester, scrapped that idea. But anyway, Superman 4, and then he, they actually got Gene Hackman, ironically, back. Now, you want to hear something funny. His nephew, Lenny, mm -hmm. actually turned out to be Lex Luthor in the Supergirl TV series now. The same guy, John Cryer. So a lot of people thought that was a nice little tie-in to Superman 4. Mm -hmm. That he might have grown up and be said, hey, I'll take on Uncle Lex's moniker and become the new Lex Luthor. Okay, so from there, that was pretty much the beginning of the end, those movies. And what happened was they got into a, a lot of trouble. By 1998, that's really when they got into trouble. Uh, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission did some investigation in their whole dealings with borrowing money, and they were misappropriating money that they didn't have and lying about their profits and stuff. And that's pretty much the beginning of the end for them. And Yoram Golem actually left and started the, it was called 21st Century Films Corporation. Gol uh, Mahakam Golan stayed, but Yoram Globus left. And he actually still, to this day, or until about 2014, Mahakam Golan actually kept producing movies for whoever was owning Canon at the time. So, over the years, like I said, they did have some hits. They had like Break-In, the Break-In movies. Cobra was a decent hit for them. Which I don't know how they got him to do that, but then they needed, they wanted to pay more for him to be an over-the-top. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the King Solomon Mines movies, those were pretty big. The American Ninja movies were pretty big. A lot of them were more big on VHS mm. than in the theater. Van Damme had a lot of successes for them. Um, over the top, hmm. I think the Chuck Norris and the Death Wish movies were very big on like um, Turner Broadcasting. Yep. Um, a lot. 
because I know they were there all the time when I was a kid. Well, what happened was MGM ended up eating up the whole library for Canon. So nowadays, what I heard is if you try to buy an old Canon movie and it's a, now it's a newer release from MGM, you're not going to see the Canon logo anymore. You're just going to see the MGM logo. And a lot of people are very upset about that because that was that Ooh. Canon logo everybody remembers. So that was a look into, we're going to wrap it up here. I just wanted to make a short and sweet video because this is a love letter to Canon Films because I was a huge fan of theirs as a child. Love their movies. Firewalker, Breakin. I mean, Barfly. My mom liked Barfly. She looked as Mickey Rourke. And it was Academy Award bait. Runaway Train, Academy Award bait. So they did have a couple of hits, but unfortunately, they could never expand that success. And they made more crap than they ever did. But now they're considered all cult classics. So that's kind of good. They did withstand the test of time. And I'm always going to love Over the Top and Cobra. Those are two of my favorites. Anything with Chuck Norris back then, the Missing in Action movies, they were pretty big movies. Anything with Charles Bronson, like you said, was pretty much a big hit. So they did have some hits, some some lo well, more losses than anything, and that was ultimately what was their demise. As they just kept selling more movies and ideas, and they never actually had the money to do it. It finally caught up with them. So that's our look into what happened to the Canon films. If you, want one, if you do want more in-depth look into what happened with them, check out those two documentaries I mentioned. The first one was Breaking, or excuse me, Electric Boogaloo, The Untold Story of Canon Films. The other one was The Go-Go Boys. That's the one that Yoram Golem produced and directed. And that's a more of a love letter to him and his uncle and the actors who actually like working for them as opposed to the ones that didn't like working for them in the uh, Electric Boogaloo documentary. So there's very contrasting views uh, depending on how you want to look at it. And I do know that the Go Go Boys is very hard to find on video, but you can find it on YouTube. I found it there myself. I hope it's a sanctioned video because if it isn't, then I feel stupid. And there's a lot, and it's a lot of it's in, is, in it's in Israeli. That's where they, because um, that's where they're from. Mm -hmm. So anyway, all right, guys. So if you like this video, you want to see more great content, make sure you subscribe. Hit the like button. Leave a comment below on some of the other canon films you remember that we didn't mention. And maybe we'll make another deeper in-depth or in-depth video about more canon films in the future. If you'd like. If not, we'll see you guys next time. Oh, and I make sure that you also share this video on social media. That helps blow up our channel a little bit. Alright guys. Till next time.